said I could teach for the next six hours. And so we've got about 35, 40 minutes. Let me get started. I want to read you from the book of Romans, chapter number eight, and tell you a very quick story. When I was a very young evangelist and I was preaching around in 1986, 1987, I was a very highly uh, inspirational preacher in those days. I was young. I was full of energy. And um, I kind of preached on my tiptoes and bounced around like a boxer. And I would get in the aisles and just all kinds of wild stuff. And one night, halfway down the aisle, wired up, uh, higher than a kite, I laid hands on a fella and started praying for him. And before I realized what I was doing, I was sort of prophesying to him. And some word of knowledge came through, speaking things that were the church knew and he knew, but I had no way of knowing. Well, in those days in the 80s, that people who were used in the spiritual gifts, they would say they operate in the gifts. And so the word got around the church, all oh, our evangelist operates in the gifts. And that was Wednesday night, and we were going Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, it made me a nervous wreck because I didn't know nothing about me and operating in no gifts. I didn't know what I had done. I didn't know how to do it again. And I knew they were all coming the next night and expecting me to, you know, operate. And so I did what you do when you get in a mess like that, full of panic. I spent the day in the prayer room. <laughs> God, you got to help me. And the Lord spoke to me one of the very, I think, only twice I could say this in my lifetime. The Lord, I felt, spoke to me almost in an audible voice and just spoke to me a scripture address, very, very clear. He said, Romans 8, 26 and 27. And uh, so... I was looking for understanding how to make this work, and I was pleading with the Lord. Let me read to you what these two verses say. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now watch verse 27. This is a very powerful secret and insight of how, in my opinion, all revelation gifts and spiritual gifts operate. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So you can see where this would be somewhat of a description almost of a word of knowledge or a prophecy or discerning of the Spirit, he which searches the hearts, you're going to look at somebody and see something about their life, know something about them, have something revealed to you about the church, the person, the group, the environment you're in. He searches the hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit, what is God saying, what is God revealing about what you have just seen through the Spirit. So you not only see it, but now you know how to address it, what to say to it, uh, what to speak to it. And all of this happens because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So I would submit to you that especially the revelation gifts, I personally believe the gift of prophecy very much so, so that would include tongues and interpretation, uh, work by intercessory prayer. If you want to be used more in spiritual gifts, involve yourself in intercessory prayer for the people of God, because the gifts of the Spirit are not for our entertainment. They are not even to make us necessarily believe in God more or demonstrate His great power so we'll know how wonderful He is. The gifts of the Spirit are to minister to the people, to alleviate their pain, to minister to their hearts, their, their, their circumstances. And when you enter into intercessory prayer, you are exercising love, and, and, and faith works by love. The gifts work by faith, but faith works by love. And so when you uh, love the saints enough to pray for them, to spend time in intercession for them, praying for the church, praying for the city, praying for the leadership, when you get before them to minister to them, uh, your faith will work by that love, and the gifts will work by that faith. So I just wanted to preface everything by saying I think the, the, the birthing grounds of the gifts of the Spirit are in intercessory prayer. 
And the less intercession we have as a body, the more difficult gifts are going to be, or when they operate, they will be sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Uh, They will not operate skillfully. There may be mistakes made, or they could operate in a shallow form. You know, it is possible to operate in the gifts of the Spirit in a shallow manner, uh, even with an improper motive. And so I think intercessory prayer is a great filtering place. And if it's if the gifts are working by love, and I think it will feel good to the body, it will feel safe to the pastor and the people of the Lord. You know, if you if you have somebody uh peering into your life, speaking to you openly, you want them to be a person who is prayerful, who is in tune with the Lord, has the character of Christ, the nature of Christ and is doing it for the right reason, for the right motive. Uh, Otherwise, if you don't have the right motive and you just want to perform, that's fine. Just leave me alone. (laughs) Just do your thing, but don't come draw me into it. But if you're going to draw people into it, you're going to draw people into public ministry or speaking to them or whatever it may be, getting into their business, so to speak. I think it is an absolute requirement that that is done by the love of God, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, in the book, I take this approach of looking at all nine of the spiritual gifts through a acronym, the acronym GIFT. When I wanted to write on this, I asked the Lord to give me something, you know, unique, give me something that would be memorable. I wanted to do more than, you know, what had already been done. And I got to looking at the word gift itself, and the Lord showed me how I could use that as an acronym and use it for each of the nine spiritual gifts. So here's what I did. I don't have time to go through all this tonight, and you'll understand when I explain it. Using the acronym gift, I go through all nine, providing a G, a governing beatitude. There are nine beatitudes. So it seemed like you can match up one of the attitudes with one of the gifts. And then an I, an insightful definition, what is a very quick snippet that you could memorize that would help you know what that particular gift is? And then an F, one of the fruit of the Spirit, interesting that there are nine fruit of the Spirit. So again, making the correlation is very easy. It cannot be an accident that there are nine Beatitudes, nine fruit of the Spirit, nine gifts of the Spirit. It must mean that they are to be, they are to operate together in tandem congruently and be part of one another to operate uh, properly. And then the T out of gift is a very unique approach, training and preparation. In other words, how do you train or how do you prepare yourself to be used in any one of the particular gifts? So I do that with all nine. Each one has a governing beatitude, an insightful definition, a fruit of the spirit that makes that one work the best, and then how to train and prepare for that particular gift. I don't have time to go through all four of those tonight. I thought that I would try to give you at least the insightful definition and try to talk some about how to train and prepare to be used in that gift. Before I get to that, a very broad overview there, the, the operation of the gifts, this is something that I've observed in my now 37 years of combined ministry, pastoring, evangelizing, working in uh, uh, national work, in, in overseas missionary work. We all, I, I've run, I run into hardly nobody that does not believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I don't think I've met a person yet that would just say, I don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I don't believe gifts of the Spirit are for today. Almost everybody would say they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Equally as strong is I've found very few people that agree with how the gifts of the Spirit have been used or are used. Uh, We say we believe in it, but when somebody starts doing it, we get very, very critical. We critique every operation, every demonstration, every way it's done. It's like we all believe it's supposed to be done, but nobody has ever seen anybody do it right yet. And so we have a very unique um, conundrum on our hands. We want this to happen, but we can't ever seem to come to agreement of how it's supposed to happen. And so I'm going to throw my two cents worth into the confusion and uh, maybe help you have a little something uh, that might help. 
One of the reasons that, that we struggle is it's very, I'm not going to say difficult, I'm going to say it's, it's, it's practically impossible to come up with a way this one certain gift is supposed to operate because there's so many variables. And I'm going to give you those variables right here. These are variables or attributes that affect how any one of the individual gifts could operate. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I decided to forego the reading of that. You're men of God, women of God, you know that the gifts of the Spirit are listed in Corinthians chapter 12 and explain. And one of the statements is that there are diversities of operations and of administrations. So a differences of administrations, and this applies to all nine gifts. So various offices, we have five-fold ministry. So prophecy will operate different in a pastor than it would an evangelist. An apostle or a prophet uh, would operate differently in the gift than a teacher would. So uh, right out of the right out of the gate, we've got five different offices using nine different gifts. That's a lot of variables. Then you get into the elders and the deacons and the helpers and the church officers and the church members and how any one of the gifts would operate. And, and you know, Sister Susie out there has been in the church for the last three years versus how that gift might operate in a prophet that would come visit the church. They're going to be very different. Uh, then there are diversities of operation. This deals with different ways of doing things, procedures maneuvers, functions, or methods. These are affected a lot by personality or by training. So you get five offices, but we all know not all pastors are the same. Not all evangelists are the same. Not all prophets are the same. So we not only have all these variables, but then within them is the personality and the history of the individual. I use the word um, impartation and we make a lot of these words magical, and I, I I try not to take the magic out, but I'm an analytical thinker, and I've kind of think I've come up with a good definition for impartation. Impartation is when you receive the timeless spiritual truths of the Bible through the personal experience or the personal paradigm of the individual doing the preaching or teaching. So, for instance, every one of us here could tell our Acts 238 story. The, the, the common denominator would be the timeless truth. We all repented. We were all baptized in Jesus' name. We were all filled with the Holy Ghost. We all spake with tongues. That part is the same. But how that happened in my life, how old I was, what the context was, where I was, how it happened for you, we would all have a different story. And that is our impartation. If I tell you my experience with any given scripture, that is my impartation. You could have a very different experience with the same scripture. Your experience might be different. The, the truth of the scripture will always be the same. His truth endureth to all generation. This is why we look to elders for impartation, because they've got a wealth of experience. They could tell you when that they leaned on that verse, when their family went through a crisis, when they were in a certain place at their church. And got, I, tonight, I gave you a verse of scripture. That was a personal experience for me out of Romans 8, how God spoke it to me. God used it as a little template of searching hearts and knowing what the Spirit's saying by making the intercession. Somebody else may have a whole different experience with how that verse worked in their life. So your impartation will affect your operation, the experience that you have with it. And I don't believe in just walking around and just throwing your hands on people and imparting a lifetime of experience. Uh, people have got, you've got to learn it. It's not magic. So uh, you have diversities of administration, which I believe administration should be spiritual. I know that a lot of spiritual people think administration is carnal or fleshly, but I pray that it is spiritual. It is listed with the spiritual gifts because as an evangelist arriving at a church, I am subject to the planning that went into the meeting. Very rarely do I have much input into planning how that meeting is going to come to pass. They choose when it's going to be, uh, who's going to sing, what the songs are going to be, how long they're going to sing, when they're going to receive the offering, when they're going to give me the floor, uh, who they've invited to the meeting, uh, how much they prayed and prepared. I, I have no control over any of that. Somebody else decided all that. The leaders of the church administrated all that. So I pray that they were spiritual and that they were led of God Otherwise, I'm trying to make bricks without straw. Your ministry office, that's the third one. 
uh, what role you your official role in the church. Obviously, the fivefold ministry fits there again. But obviously, if you're a district superintendent or a presbyter, or if you're the uh, if you're one of the church officers, what your official role is will affect how the gifts operate in your life. Uh, number four is the anointing, the anointing. This is the power, the raw power of God that is upon your life through prayer and fasting. This is God anointing you to be successful. It is the anointing that destroys the yoke. It is anointing that overcomes opposition. Sometimes it's just raw power, and that will affect how preaching flows it also affects how the gifts operate. Then what is your call? What is the call of God upon your life? In other words, what is God's will? Uh, what area of ministry are you involved in? If you're a children's minister, the gifts are going to function differently in you than if you're doing marriage seminars, or if you're a pastor, or if you're a missionary on a foreign field somewhere, or an evangelist traveling from place to place. So whether you're, if you're in a small church with eight or nine people, or you're in a large church with eight or 900 people, the call of God, where you're called, who you're called to, if you're called to a certain culture, all of that will affect how the gifts flow. Then your, your level or your dimension of spiritual authority and dominion, authority over the spirit realm, uh, spiritual operation, uh, this is directly related to your submission, who you're submitted to, uh, how, uh, how you're submitted, to what level you're submitted, to what degree. All of these are variables that affect how the gifts will operate in your life. Your personal consecration. You know, a lawyer can be a crook, and some of them are, and still operate in law. A doctor can be dying of cancer and perform a uh, operation on you and you get well, but a, a preacher cannot operate outside of who he is and what his personal integrity with God is, your personal consecration. This is your relationship with the Lord, your personal lifestyle, your holiness living and holiness lifestyle uh, is going to affect how the gifts operate. They may operate either way, but they can be sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. They can be very irritating and almost annoying if the person is gifted but fleshly. Uh, and it is possible to be gifted and be fleshly. So your personal consecration is very big variable. And then the last variable that I would bring up is the variable of soil, your audience, your atmosphere. All ministry and spiritual operations are affected by the spiritual condition uh, that you are ministering to. Uh, you learn this very quickly as an evangelist, for instance. Uh, as you well know, we go from church to church preaching the same sermons. And I usually get in a vein where there's a certain message in my spirit that I preach for a while. That seems to be what God is carrying me from church to church. And then I'll, I'll literally feel it almost lift from me. And God, something else the Lord's been dealing with me about, I'll feel very strong to go that way. And that'll settle into my spirit. And I'll carry that for a while. And uh, you can go from one church on a Sunday morning or a, a midweek service and preach it. And uh, people are uh, moved, coming to the altar, weeping and crying, several receiving the Holy Ghost four or five people telling you their life has been changed forever and just go the very next night to another place 30 miles away and they're looking at their watches and they're bored and they're chewing gum and, you know, nobody gets the Holy Ghost, nobody gets baptized and you leave feeling like, you know, you should go, you know, drive a truck or something. Uh, like you're the greatest failure. You go from feeling like the world's greatest evangelist to the world's worst. And, and that used to throw me for a loop until I realized that uh, you, you can sow the exact same seed and it will fall in different kinds of soil. And the variable is the soil, the context. And that's why we are so grateful for and very dependent upon pastors, especially because pastors work soil. Uh, week in and week out, they are trying to get those people to a context and a condition where the prophecies can come to pass, the, the evangelistic efforts will be fruitful, where the intercessory prayer will flow. You know, they're trying to work that some of that hard soil and wayside soil and stony ground into good soil so when the seed is sown. And so uh, another very important topic with, with gifts of the Spirit is spiritual warfare. 
because sometimes it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that the, the, the context of the spirit realm has to be overcome and affected. And I've, I've taught some pastors and churches to take some time out and do some spiritual warfare, have some prayer meetings, go into some hours of intercession, and then just go back and preach the same sermons you preached last year and watch the difference. You realize there was nothing wrong with the sermon. You were just throwing seed on wayside soil or in an atmosphere that was not conducive. And so uh, one of the things I've been doing here over the last few weeks, uh, my wife and I did it this morning. We'll do it again tomorrow morning. We're meeting with all those that will come, and we are having a morning uh, 6 a.m. prayer. Last week in Dallas, it was 5 a.m., and we had 40 people showing up from the church for 5 a.m. prayer. And my wife has a morning prayer call that has 189 registered, usually about 150 on the call. I take my phone and hook the microphone to it so they could hear that playing over the sound system, several hundred of us praying and change the atmosphere so that what we're doing will work better, so that the seed sown will fall on good soil. So these are some variables, you know, uh, and as you look at all those variables, and then you look at all those variables with the nine gifts of the Spirit, you realize there, there's a hundred ways from Sunday that prophecy might function. <laughs> I mean, prophesying on the phone is different from prophesying in a microphone. Uh, prophesying in the altar to somebody is different from prophesying to somebody at work and who you're prophesying to and the content. I mean, it's just, so really, I think we need to open our hearts and our tolerance and realize that there's really no one set way for a lot of this stuff to operate. There are a lot of possibilities, and I think we should share them with one another. But I, I think oftentimes pastors, for instance, are operating in the gifts of the Spirit just almost intuitively, whether they're counseling or standing in the altar talking to somebody or talking with somebody on the phone and things are coming from the Holy Ghost. They don't stop to say, now, sister, I'm going to prophesy to you right now, although you might if it comes that strong. Many times you just do. Many times God just shows you something. Well, you know what I feel? I feel this is what we need to do. Well, where'd that feeling come from? A lot of that is the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, but you know, you just don't take the time to identify it and say it and announce it. It just flows out of you, and you do it, and you go on to the next thing. And that's one manner of operation. And then at other times, it might be profitable to, to alert the person that I'm getting ready to speak into your heart. God has showed me something about you, and that might be a profitable way to do it. So my point of all of that is to show you that there are many, many ways for these gifts to function through all of us as individuals. And let's give each other you know, some room and some space to do it the way, you know, we feel. And uh, I think we're all here to help one another. And the Bible does say, let one prophesy and let the others judge. So I think that means uh, you have to be willing, if you're the one doing the operation or speaking the word or flowing, to be willing to, to be judged, to be examined. But I think that's true of preaching. I think that's true of all of our offices we hold. You're going to get elected to an office, you know, we're going to pay attention to how you do it. <laughs> and if we don't like the way you're doing it, we might tell you we don't like it. And uh, or we just vote for someone else next time around. But uh, there's lots of ways for us to uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, uh, put boundaries to one another, hold each other accountable. That's the one I was looking for. Lots of ways for us to hold one another accountable. And if we're used in the gifts of the spirit, I think you have to be willing to be held accountable and, uh, you know, be judged and hear what maybe pastor would have to say about what you said. And I just think if we're going to judge somebody, just remember, you will be judged by the same harshness or the same level. So you might want to show a little bit of mercy because you might get something wrong every once in a while yourself. All right, let me try to give you some specifics here. I, I know I've been doing some general overviewing, but I think it's important. I think that it's the context. It's very, very difficult to talk about gifts without talking about context, because I think context really defines so much of how the gifts operate. But let me go down through giving you some insightful definitions and how to perhaps train or prepare to be used in that gift. Those are the two I want to hit. So let's just start with the word of knowledge. Uh, let, let, let me back up a second. I want to say something very quickly that you probably already know. You know that the gifts of the Spirit are very easily um, categorized in three main categories. 
uh, the speaking gifts, uh, uh, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy, the action gifts, healing, faith, and miracles, and the knowing gifts, uh, uh, the knowledge gifts of word of knowledge, discerning of the spirit, and word of wisdom. So there are gifts to know supernaturally, speak supernaturally, and act supernaturally. So these are three different general flows for those gifts to operate in. And I always try to pay attention and kind of see which way the wind's blowing and where the strength is and get in that vein. And, and you know, if you can just categorize it, first of all, at least you know what what three to narrow down where you might want to be looking. Uh, the word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation of the physical world or of situations, uh, illness in the human body, events. The word of knowledge is God supernaturally revealing to you something literal, tangible, uh, physical, knowable, and it, I would like to remind you that it is a word of knowledge. It is not always the entire equation. It is a snippet. It is a piece of that understanding. And so a word of knowledge is God revealing something to you that is very natural. You know, we see this a lot of times when we have some stuff in the laundry here, and it sounds like the buzzer's going on. Uh, it, when we see somebody tell somebody, you know, you've been having headaches or uh, the Lord reveals to me, you've been having, you've had a back injury. That would be a word of knowledge. And that gift, I'll just, I'll hold the training on that one. And, and I'll talk to you about the discerning of spirits, because I know a lot of people connect word of knowledge and word of wisdom. I connect word of knowledge and discerning of spirits. I think the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits are the exact same gift in two different dimensions. The discerning of spirits is a supernatural revelation of the spirit world or of emotions or of the atmosphere, spirit realm, uh, angels, demons, or even the human spirit. So, for instance, uh, you, you had a back injury, if that's correct, word of knowledge. You've been um, going through a very difficult time lately emotionally, and you've been emotionally unstable, even dealing with some depression. That would be discerning of the spirits. Anything that deals with emotion, um, the human spirit, the demonic world, demonic attack, discerning what spirit might be attacking, what spirit might be moving, that would be discerning of the spirits. Um, let me, I'm very sorry to do this, but that's going to keep buzzing. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. So we're dealing with, you know, two dimensions of the same operation, supernatural revelation, physical world, spirit world, emotional. Uh, and some people are more skillful in discerning of spirits. Many pastors, you know, Brother Cole, I traveled with Brother Cole for 17 years. And Brother Cole was known for the gift of faith. But his strongest gift was discerning of spirits by far. It was just that was not used publicly as much. It was behind the scenes. It was, I saw it because I was with him. I spent a lot of time with him, had a lot of conversations, and he would know what to do and how to behave and where to go and what was happening a lot of times by discerning it. So I'm going to give you now what is how to train or how to set yourself up, get yourself in position to be used more greatly in the word of knowledge in the discerning of spirits. And I'm going to make a statement that I really think applies to the gifts of the spirit and walking in the spirit overall. And that is observation is the first level of revelation. The first thing you're going to have to train yourself to do is observe, uh, pay attention, look around, take it all in, keep your head in the game, as Brother Cole used to say, stay tuned in. Because the word of knowledge and discerning of spirits are both practiced through observation. Observation. Pay attention. Now, um, there's a little pet peeve of mine, but, you know, I'm dealing with it. We're going through this season now where everybody's taking the chairs off the platform. And uh, there's nothing in the Bible about where the chairs have to be, and I understand that. But as a guest minister, it's, it's easier for me if I can be on the platform, look around, and observe the people before I get up to minister. Because everybody's going to want me to get up and speak all kinds of things that the Holy Ghost is showing me. And I'm trying to preach the word and look at people and figure out the context. 
So they got to sit down there in the chairs. So what I do now is I try to walk around a little bit and look at the congregation and observe and get on my tiptoes. And <laughs> I, I got to see what I'm dealing with here. And, uh, you know, many times it's, you know, we only have one service on Sunday. So you got one chance. You got to get it all done and get it done very quickly. And so um, I, I'm doing my best with what we have to work with. So observation is very powerful. Word of knowledge and discerning of spirits. Then you get into the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom, I'm going to give you a very different definition than probably what you're used to. But this is the definition that really sits well with my particular operation. The word of wisdom is an instruction from God or an action on the part of the believer, or you might say the part of the receiver from that instruction, that connects you to the supernatural, releases a miracle. It's God telling you to do something, showing you to do something, some action, some thing you do, some instruction God gives you, some action you take, that when you do it, it releases something supernatural. So this gift is practiced through the process of obedience. If you just learn to obey God, you're standing in the, the, the chair, and the Lord tells you, get out in the aisle and worship. That's obedience. Just do it. That way you'll be ready to do the, the bigger things, uh, the more uh, valuable things, the more risky things. You train yourself. If you're, if you're uh, up early in the morning and the Lord says, go to the church and pray, and you're used to praying in your office, but you feel like the Lord told you to go to the church. Well, you don't feel like going to the church. It's cold outside. But if you feel like the Lord told you to do that, just do it. The more you practice being obedient, doing what God tells you to do, call this person, call that person, do this, do that, whatever the case may be, uh, you get used to obeying, and then you get in a situation where the Lord's ready to do a miracle. He may tell you to do something that seems kind of odd, but you've gotten used to doing it. So we've seen a lot of strange things happen in churches. I've seen people throw their handkerchief down, so whoever shouts on the handkerchief is going to get their healing. I've, I was in one service one time where a man was telling a story about preaching at a church, and this uh, this little girl, eight, nine, ten-year-old girl, something like that, fell out in the aisle having an asthmatic attack. Well, being a parent and having raised little babies, you know, we all knew for whatever reason that little baby stopped breathing or whatever, you just go over there and blow in their face and make them catch a breath. So he said before he really thought about what he was doing, he just felt inspired. He ran down there from the pulpit, snatched that little girl up, tilted her head up, and just blew in her face, and she kind of only caught a breath, but got miraculously healed and was on her feet. And so the parents explained she was having an asthmatic attack. So he said, was there anybody else here got asthma? And some other lady walked up. So he blew in her face, and then another one came up, and he blew in her face. Now, this is about the time most of us are checking out. <laughs> I don't believe that's the way to give cyber eight. Bless God, that's not foolishness in the house of God. Okay, so I was sitting in the congregation when this man was telling that story. And we were all kind of feeling about like that. And you could feel it across the congregation. So he says like this, he says, oh, I feel you. He says, let me show you. Anybody here got asthma? <laughs> Lady raised her hand. She walked up there. He blew up her nose. She got healed. He said, anybody else? Another lady walked up there. He blew up her nose. Okay, well, I'm sitting next to a pastor way in the back, and I leaned over and said, now, you, y'all you know I'm kind of bold, right? Yeah, I'm kind of, you're bold. I said, but let me just tell you right now, I don't think there will ever be a day you're going to see old Clondents blowing up people's noses. I just don't think I'm going to ever do that. That's just, I, I just can't imagine a context in which I would do that. Pastor kind of chuckled, said, yeah, me either. I said, let me tell you what else. He said, what? I think if I had asthma, I'd go get in that line. <laughs> because as weird and odd and awkward as that situation was, it did appear that every single one of them was getting healed. So Jesus spoke the trees and spit in the mud and made eyeballs. And so I guess, you know, Brother Tinney used to say there's a fine line between the glory and the goofy. And so I think what I've taught guys, go ahead and do whatever you feel led to do, but it has to work. If it doesn't work, you got to get rebuked. You're just being stupid. I remember one time years ago, um, there was a elderly lady. I didn't, wasn't really thinking about how old she was, but everybody was shouting. She wasn't shouting. I went over there and snatched her up on her feet. And her eyes got big as 
golf balls. She said, I don't walk. I don't walk. And I looked down. Sure enough, she had leg braces from her shoes all the way up to her knees. And before I even thought about what I was doing, I kicked her, kicked her right in her leg brace, 70 something year old grandma. Well, she went to shouting and praising the Lord and we took the leg braces off and she walked and it was a great miracle and thank God for it. Because if that woman hadn't got healed, I would be that, whatever happened to that one guy? That's what y'all be saying. You would never heard no Doug Klein did. You, I, that one guy, whatever happened to that one guy that kicked that lady? Well, I don't know. Her, her grandson's got him. We never did hear from him again. If you kick grandma, grandma's got to get healed or you're in serious trouble. So whereas I'm given a lot of liberty to do whatever you feel to do, it does have to work. I'll give you one last illustration of that. Um, I was in a church service one time years ago. And the pastor was so excited. He said, Brother Klein Dennis is here tonight. We're going to have a powerful move of God. People are going to get healed and delivered, loose and set free. And uh, what he didn't know is I was standing there thinking, this is the debt of service I think I've been in in my life. I, I don't know what in the world we're going to do here. I wasn't sure I could even preach. I was worried would I even be able to preach in that service. And he's up there announcing signs, wonders, and miracles. And so I didn't know what to do. So I walked to the pulpit. And I looked around and people had their sweaters on and their coats on and they were chewing gum. And I said, look, we could have signs, wonders and miracles, but we're in no way anywhere close to ready. I said, but I feel like if we would take our coats off and our sweaters off and get rid of the gum and God could do it. So people started removing their coats and putting, getting the gum gone. And I said, why don't we just stand and lift our hands and magnify the Lord? Those people raised their hands, started worshiping God, the power of God hit. I never even did preach. Laying hands, prophesying, palming heads, slinging oil. We had a Holy Ghost time, just like Pastor said. The word of wisdom for that service was get some of these layers of clothes off and get rid of that gum. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so we got to be careful you don't make gimmicks out of these things. Just because it works in one place doesn't necessarily mean it'll work in the next place. But God might have remind you what you did one time years ago to do that again. I'm running out of time, so let me hurry on to these other gifts. I want to at least give you the definitions and a um, little bit of understanding. So uh, the gift of tongues and interpretation, let's do those together because they work closely together. The gift of tongues is a message to the church in an unknown tongue, and it requires an interpretation. It is spoken by one individual at a time. And then, of course, the gift of tongues requires that we pause and wait for the interpretation. Uh, and this is the message uh, to the church in the known tongue, which is the theme or the basic idea, the basic concept of what the, the, the message was. It is not a verbatim translation. As a matter of fact, I believe the tongues is more to alert the church that God wants to speak than it is necessarily speaking the actual message that then has to be interpreted. It's uh, it's not a translation. It is an interpretation that God is desiring to speak. And so this would explain why sometimes the tongues last about seven or ten seconds and the interpretation goes on for two or three minutes or why you might have a minute and a half or two minutes of tongues, and then the interpretation is very short, because you're not interpreting or translating, you know, exactly. I, I've traveled all over the world, you know, and uh, some of these cultures, their languages are quite unique, and I've gone up to the pulpit before, and I've said, uh, uh, it was a very long trip, and my body is very tired, but I'm very excited to be here, feel like the Lord has led me here, and, and God's going to bless us. And my translator says, and I'm like, <laughs> he just told him he's happy to be here. <laughs> he summed it all up, gave him the basic idea and left out. And then there have been other times I just said, I'm so happy to be here. God has sent me to you. And then he, the interpreter goes on for a while, you know, and I'm looking at him, man, I didn't say all that. Well, he's just, you know, he, the man of God is happy to be here. We've been praying and fasting. We're so glad that he's finally arrived. God has sent him. Great things are going to happen. So, you know, it's uh, some of this kind of stuff will happen with tongues interpretation. The tongues. Now, this is just my belief. I believe that tongues, the Bible sets a, a, a boundary, that it be one, two, three, and that by course. So you can have tongues come, and you could have it come twice or even three times. 
Uh, you could have interpretation once, twice, or even three times. There won't be four because somebody like me would be stopping it. Because we're bound by scripture to do that. I believe there's an occurrence of tongues and an occurrence of interpretation. So even though you have two occurrences of tongues, you may only need one occurrence of interpretation, especially if they happen back to back. Somebody gives tongues, no interpretation comes, another tongues. One interpretation is fine. These are not necessarily two separate messages. These are two occurrences of the singular gift. The gift of tongues operated through one, two, or three occurrences. Then you could have one gift of tongues. You could possibly have two occurrences of interpretation, they, you know, two angles or two parts of a, of a whole message. So I don't personally believe that the, uh, the number of occurrences of tongues have to match the number of occurrences of interpretation. I guess one variable in that would be if, if tongues come in the worship service and we had interpretation, then obviously if you get, you know, an hour later in the altar service, you have tongues. Chances are you probably need another. This is God speaking a second time. But um, so one, two, or three, and then one, two, or three. But I don't think the length has to match or the number of occurrences have to match for it to be the gift of tongues and interpretation. I hope all that's making sense to you. I know I'm doing that kind of fast. Um, then you add to that the gift of prophecy. The way you train yourself to be used in tongues and interpretation is through practicing being spontaneous, spontaneous. It's similar to obedience, the difference being you have to do it so much quicker. If you're up praying and God tells you to go to the church, you may dwell on that, discern that, think about that for 10 or 15 minutes, finally decide, you know what, this is not lifting. I think this is something God really wants me to do. Or you wake up in the night, can't fall back to sleep. You may lay there for 20 minutes before you decide, and then you do obey because it won't lift. That would be obedience. In spontaneity, you have to do it very quickly. It comes to you and you have to move fast. And the way you practice being used in tongues interpretation is, is to learn to move quickly in the spirit. Whatever God leads you to do it, do it as fast as it comes to your mind. Because a lot of times tongues interpretation, there's a window of opportunity and you got to move quickly to get the tongues in there or to get the interpretation. They're supposed to happen uh, right together. So uh, being spontaneous, the, the Pentecostal people used to be very spontaneous. We are not nearly as spontaneous as we used to be or we need to be. The third one there is prophecy, and um, prophecy is basically a declaration of divine intention, a declaration of divine intention. Now, I'm giving you my, uh, my impartation here. I believe prophecies are conditional on the receiving of the individual and the obedience of the individual. You can prophesy to somebody that's new in the church. God's going to use you as a soul winner. God wants to bless you mightily to be a great soul winner, bring many people into the house of God. Well, uh, they may be so early in their walk with God that they're still getting their own soul saved. So we've de declared God's intention, but obviously that's not going to happen if they backslide. That's not going to happen if they don't stay obedient. We can prophesy to people about ministry or about how God wants to use them in certain gifts or bless them in certain ways. Uh, I have people come up, want me to prophesy over their billfold or over some bills or over some financial situation. I'll often ask them, are you paying your tithes and giving offering? Because I can prophesy over this billfold all day long, but I cannot trump the principles of God's word. It could very much be God's divine intention to bless you mightily and prosper you greatly. And you're sensing that and looking for confirmation. And I could be feeling the same confirmation. But God's intention can be stopped by people's disobedience or violation of his word. And I'm going to give you an example. It's God doesn't always get his way or his will. It's not God's will that any should perish. He died on the old rugged cross, shed his blood, that people would not go to hell. And yet people will go to hell in violation of the cross, in violation of his will, in violation of the, the extreme measure he went to to make it possible. Because human will can resist and deny God's will. And so that there's a whole other understanding there. People can deny the will of God in your life. Nobody can affect your destiny but you. But people can prevent you from uh, momentary uh, things God would have. So uh, prophecy is a declaration of divine intent. 
God saying what he wants to do, willing to do, offering to do. Sometimes it can be time stamped. I've been a little careful about time stamping because people can delay God's will and then they blame you for it, but uh, it is possible. And then um, that gift is practiced through encouraging because prophecy is divine encouragement. We get word of knowledge and prophecy greatly confused. People think you walk around telling people something about their life. And uh, yesterday, nine o'clock in the morning, you got up and prayed and got that's that's not prophecy. That's word of knowledge. And so uh, prophecy is more like a divine gift of encouragement. And if you feel like you're used in prophecy or want to be Encourage people out of your own spirit. Encourage people from your knowledge of the word of God. Encourage people by what you know to do. And as you do that yourself, you pave a pathway for God to start encouraging people through you. You'll go to give somebody just a basic encouragement, but you'll be speaking something comes directly from God because you paved the way. You created a flow for your own actions for them to become miraculous and become God's actions. And we are by the scripture uh, allowed to, and even I think directed to encourage one another. All right, let me try to wrap this up so we can have some questions here. Uh, The last three gifts are the action gifts. These are the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, and the working of miracles. The gift of faith is so powerful. It really, uh, when people ask me what gift should I pray for, I always direct them to the gift of faith. This is a God-given unction to believe. This is God causing you to believe. This is not your faith. This is not mustard seed faith. This is not great faith. This is God putting it in your heart and God causing you to believe it. It's not human choice. It's not human reasoning. It is 100% void of doubt because it initiates with God. God causes you to believe. That's why it's called a gift. God gave it to you. God put that believing for that in his heart. Uh, This gift is practiced. You practice speaking scripture and speaking things that are not as though they were. You speak to the opposites. You speak to things that are one way that need to be another way, and you speak to them by the scripture, and you learn to speak by faith. You speak faith. You speak faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You declare faith. You declare healing when you're in pain. You declare victory when you're being defeated. You declare the joy of the Lord when you're going through a struggle. And you do that by the authority of God's word, by the by the legitimacy of his promises. But you do that enough, you get in a a flow of speaking God's word, speaking things that are not as though they were, speaking it into existence, prophetic praying, I like to call it. You do it first by inspiration of the word. But the more you do that, you create a flow or a momentum, and then prophetic praying can come through. You start speaking in prophecy, or you God gives you the gift of faith. You, you come out of prayer meeting just absolutely convinced that a certain thing's going to happen. You can't justify it. You don't know how to explain it. You don't know how to reason it, but you're absolutely convinced of it as though it's already done. That is a very powerful gift of faith. I remember one time in Pakistan in a great meeting with 85,000 people, uh, we prayed the word of faith, the power of God came in. I said, God has opened blinded eyes. If your eyes have been opened, won't you come over here to the right and tell us about the great miracle? And it was about that quiet right there, and there was 85,000 people that quiet. Everybody just looking around. Missionary Sean was looking at me like Casper the Friendly Ghost, like, you know, I'm going to have to get you out of here. It didn't even occur to me that I was being bold or that I had made a profound statement. It didn't occur to me it was courageous. I was absolutely sure of it as if I just said, um, this, this microphone's too loud or too soft. It was just a God put that in my heart to believe. I was sure it happened. Well, long story short, we had a little commotion over there. It wasn't a fight. Uh, the first man came up and blind for a number of years. He was healed. Eight blinded people that night gave their testimony. It never occurred to me until hours later, after the service was over, we had many other miracles. After we went to eat in the dining uh, area they had for us preachers, And then I got to the room, had my shower, was in my pajamas, was laying in bed in the dark when this thought crossed my mind. Now, what would have you done if that hadn't happened? Never crossed my mind because it wasn't my faith 
God caused me to believe it. And so it was the gift of faith. All right. Gifts of healing and working of miracles. The gifts of healing are practice. Oh, I won't tell you what it is first. Gift of healing is a progressive restoration of the human body. It's a progressive restoration of elements uh, that improve through time. Relationships could improve through time. The condition of, of, a, of a family atmosphere could improve through time. God could heal a family. God could heal a relationship, heal a marriage, heal a relationship with a father and a son or a mother and a daughter or vice versa, um, and could heal the body over a period of time. If somebody is dying, they have a tumor and it's growing and you pray over them and they feel God, and then it starts getting smaller. It may take six weeks for that to completely shrink and go away. But if it dries up, goes away, instead of killing them, it was a healing. It was a great miracle. So, so when people feel God touch and they feel an improvement, even if it's not 100%, they need to claim that as a healing. You know, if I cut my finger and put a Band-Aid on it and it doesn't heal up in the next 30 seconds, I don't get all upset. I know, give it a few days, it'll be fine. And it slowly gets better. That's healing. If somebody's dying of something or has a horrible problem and God heals them, they will slowly get better and better and better, even if it takes weeks or even months. If they don't die of it, they get healed of it. I pray for people to come off of deathbeds and all kinds of stuff. And then the working of miracles is an instantaneous and complete restoration. And that could be of the human body or a divine intervention in elements, even uh, relationships, you know, just out of the blue, somebody calls, they're repenting each other on the phone. They get, it's a miracle. It's a miracle when it happens so quickly. Now, the gifts of healing are practiced and so are working of miracles practiced through the laying on of hands, especially in America. We lay hands on people, we anoint with oil. And I'll make a little prophecy to you. The more people you pray for, the more people will get healed. It's kind of safe, isn't it? The more people you pray for, the more people you lay hands on. Uh, people come up to me and want, I forget the oil, I lay hands and pray, and I pray for them to get healed, and I pray for a miracle to take place. The more miracles I pray for, the more I see. Everybody I pray for doesn't seem like they get a miracle instantaneously. They don't all seem like they got healed on the spot. Many of them I find out weeks or even months later about things that did happen in their life. Um, I remember, I'll tell you this story as I close. I was, I was in Papua New Guinea. And it was an outside service, and a family had brought their very sick child uh, to the to the crusade early in the morning, laid him out in the grass with them, and that child died even before the service even started, stopped breathing. By the time we were done with the service, that child, the lips were completely blue, the child was, was completely cold, and they bring this child up, carrying him about 10 years old. A uh, father carrying him, child just hanging off his arms, and they explained to me through the interpreter that this child had been very sick for a long time and died in the morning. And uh, I touched the child, cold, clammy. You could just tell by the color and everything, just this is a bad situation. And so we had several ministers there. I said, let's pray. And I laid my hands on his head. His head was cold. I started praying and praying and praying, and they're praying, and I was peeking out of one eye to see nobody's really feeling nothing, and nothing was really happening. And I I was prepared to, you know, I pastored for enough years, been with enough people in grief. I was started to move into comforting the, the family. I was getting ready to speak through the interpreter, words of comfort and God being with them. When the, the spirit of the Lord thundered inside of me and said, you are praying for the child like he is sick. Pray for him like he is dead and see what I will do. And so this might have been Brother Cole's training. When Brother Cole got powerful and full of faith, he got loud. So, so I just raised my hand up and with the loudest voice I could muster, I said, I command you to come to life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I put my hand on that boy's head and my hand got hot like a fever in it. I could feel it. And I said, come on, something's happening. And then after a little bit, I switched hands and that boy's head, I could feel a warmth on the forehead. And I was feeling down here and I could feel some warmth here. Made it about to the shoulder area neck. Everything else was still cold. I was so full of faith. That child never flinched that I saw. All drew a bro them the boy's alive tell them the boy is healed everything's all right the interpreter told them and they walked away carrying that child to my visual not a single change whatsoever 
And again, it didn't occur to me till I got my Bible together and got on the bus. What did you just do? You can't be telling people stuff like that if you don't know. I mean, that's nothing to play with. But I was so full of faith at the moment. And uh, the way the story goes, I went on to the airport. They put the child in the back of a pickup truck, covered him with a blanket, had to head up into the mountains, an hour drive. And about halfway up the side of that mountain, he scared everybody in that truck when he started knocking on the back window and said he was thirsty. And then they gave him some food. And by the time I made it to America and got the email, little Isaiah was playing outside as though he had never been sick. And so it, even the miracle took a few minutes. Now, looking back and being a little more experienced in this now, I would have probably stayed with it there till we saw some kind of uh, at least I would have tried to get some kind of response and see some kind. I wouldn't have sent them away until I saw some kind of evidence. But in those days, I was just. Um, I know this has been fast. I know that I have moved through these definitions uh, and you prepare, you use yourself in miracles and healings through the laying on of hands. If you were taking notes, there's this, all of this and much more in the book and all of this and much more in these, in this gifts of the spirit. I go through these a little slower, a little more deliberate, try to tell some stories, but I wanted to give some time for, oh, we're out of time. I'm sorry. I'll do whatever you want to do, brother. Watch. I, I, I was watching my um, clock over here, and it was different than what that time says. Uh, if you want, this has been so so rich. We, uh, I, I've studied gifts of the spirit. I have uh, heard teaching on it, but some of the stuff that you've covered tonight, especially with the context at the beginning, was so very very rich. Um, I know there could we could probably talk about this stuff from now till sun up in the morning. But I know you probably would answer a lot of those questions in the material that you have available. So why don't you uh, give them uh, how they can contact you and again, how they could order those uh, resources and maybe we can just be satisfied with that. So this is the gifts of the spirit, the DNA of gifts of the spirit. If you go to my website, you'll see I have three of these DNA of revival, DNA of ministry, DNA of gifts. It's the purple one. The problem on the website is, like, what, what's is, the address for that website? It's my name, Doug Kleindenst.com. D O U G K L I N E. Well, my name's on my screen there, Doug, but it's Doug Kleindenst, not Douglas. Doug Kleindenst.com, all lowercase. So I recommend you just use the donation um, button, $50. It's $79 if you go through actually buying this, but $50, I've said tonight. Uh, give a donation. Make sure you put your email address in there or phone number so I can get to you. And then this one on the Apostolic Ministries, $50. You're welcome to give more. You're actually welcome to give less. If you don't have $50, you want to just throw $30 in there, uh, I'll send it to you anyway. Uh, that's just the number I throw out. If you want to use your camera, open up your camera. The big QR code, you can use a credit card, Apple Pay, or Google Pay. It'll bring you right up to my website donation. The little, the two small QR codes, one is Cash App and one is PayPal. I do have Venmo. It's my name, Doug Kleindens. Just remember, if you use any of those, you're going to have to text me. I'll give you my phone number. And let me know, or so I will know to be able to send you something. 636, this is my phone number, my cell phone. 636-284-1206. 636-284-1206. And if you aim your camera, you don't have to take a picture of that, but just aim your camera at it and push the little yellow link that comes up, it'll take you there. If, and what I'll do is I'll take a picture of these cards, the back of these cards. There's a website on the back and the in the code, and I'll send you this, and you'll be able to download it right away. So if you if you gave a donation tonight, I could send you this tonight, and you could download it tonight. You don't have to wait to get something in an email or in the mail. And there's others there, but so it'd be a hundred dollars for both of them. If you give a hundred, I'll just assume you want them both. If you give fifty, you'll have to tell me which one you want. I'll assume it's the gifts of the spirit. I, we could just take a few minutes if I've created any kind of controversy or said any. I know I was talking fast. If I said something backwards or wrong, I'd be happy to clarify or 
All right. And if you do want to ask something or make a comment, you will have to unmute yourself. We've got 67 participants, so surely I've messed somebody up. <laughs> Hello, Brother Blake, my good friend. Praise the Lord, Brother Klein Dance. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Great. God bless you. One thing I wanted to say is that I believe the gifts of the Spirit should be complementary to preaching. I don't think they replace preaching. Not that they couldn't in one single service somewhere. I mean, sometimes we sing and have a move of God or give an altar call. We don't. I mean, there could be a circumstance where we just break out prophesying and using gifts and not preach. But I don't think that should be the common function. I don't think gifts replace preaching ever. Right. Here's a question that came in on the comments. What would you say is a sign or signs that you do have the gift of the discerning of spirits? Let's say you get around somebody. Um, you're having a good day. You're happy. You get around somebody, get to talking to them, and suddenly you're angry. You're just getting angry, and you don't even know why you're getting angry. Or you're feeling depressed, or you, you start feeling fear. Talking to somebody, your heart starts beating. You start feeling fearful. And you cannot connect what you're feeling. Why am I feeling fear? I got nothing to be afraid of. Why am I feeling angry? I ain't mad at nobody. Why am I being depressed? I'm having a happy day. You might want to alert yourself that you might be feeling them. Now, if you have a reason, if there's a trigger, if something happened that made you mad, then you're just mad. But it, you can get around people and feel what they have. And if you have no context for feeling that way, then I start looking around me. Now, I try not to be a spooky person. I think you can be spiritual without being spooky. But trust me when I tell you this stuff works in a lot of wild ways. I could be standing in a group, three or four people, start feeling a certain something. And if I have no context for it, I just start looking around that group, see where it's coming from. I don't necessarily say anything. I'm not going to not try and call nobody out. I certainly don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't think the gift should be for embarrassment. Here's a little something I teach, and I, I know I'm going off here, but I, this is in my spirit and it needs to be said. Something I teach churches about prophecy and the gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. I teach that all the gift of prophecy is always positive, always encouraging, always uplifting. The gift of prophecy that works in the body of Christ will never be judgmental, will never be condemning, and is never going to rebuke leadership or reveal hidden sin. 100% of the time. And then everybody immediately thinks of David and Nathan, and thou art the man. But what you're dealing with there is you're dealing with a prophet, one of the fivefold ministry. Prophets reprove, rebuke, and exhort, just like evangelists and pastors and teachers and apostles. So if it's a fivefold ministry office, all that stuff may possibly happen. But the gift working in the saints, the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy does not rebuke. The gift of prophecy does not condemn. The gift of prophecy is always positive. That doesn't restrict the body. That releases them. Now they know they don't have to go around putting doom and gloom on people. So good. So good. What are the best ways to develop your ability for intercessory prayer, like you mentioned? So intercessory prayer is something you have to, um, it's like weightlifting. You have to build it. You have to grow it, grow in grace, grow in knowledge. The, the, the way to launch into intercessory prayer is next time you're praying, you get to thinking about somebody you love dearly that's lost, that's going to be, if they were to die today, they're going to hell. And you think about the judgment, you think about the pain they're in, you think about the suffering, maybe if they're on drugs or they're in jail, something's in their life, something's destroying them. You think about somebody that is the closest to you that you love the most that is in trouble, and you get to pray in for them. Very easy to intercede for those people. Intercessory prayer is standing in the gap. My wife and I teach on this extensively. Sometimes you stand between this person you love and God. They're not asking for mercy. They're not asking for grace. They're not repenting. 
So we go to God on their behalf and we say, Lord, I know they're not asking for mercy, but I'm asking you for mercy. I'm asking you to show your grace. I'm asking you, Lord, to send an angel. So on their behalf, we intercede to God because they're not doing it. Or we stand between them and the demonic forces. They're not rebuking the devil. They're not resisting the devil. They're not warding off spirits. So we go stand between them and we tell the devil, now I know they're not rebuking you, but I am. And I am rebuking you on their behalf. I am their intercessor. I am their advocate. And this is very easy to do if it's your son or your daughter or somebody you care about. You know, somebody told Charlie Mahaney one time before Nick was back in church and doing right and preaching, he was telling about all Nick's escapades, being in jail, being on drugs, getting arrested. Somebody told Charlie Mahaney after service said, if that's my boy, I wouldn't put up with all that. And Charlie said, if it was your boy, I wouldn't put up with it either. <laughs> that's my boy. And when it's yours, somebody you care about, you'll be a little less judgmental and your love will flow from that dimension. You can move into the spirit. You can move into the love of God, where God loves them more than you, and God loves lost people and pastors, people that irritate you, people that are always on your nerves, people that are causing church trouble that you've been angry with. You can actually, through the love of God, get into intercessory prayer for them. You may not be able to do it in your own emotion because they are just they are just resisting you at every turn. But through the love of God, no matter how much church trouble they're causing, God loves them. He died for them. He wants them saved. And ultimately, we do too. But we're balancing that between them and all these people that they're harming and hurting. And we're trying to, but you get into intercession, you can intercede for rebellious people and intercede. So, so you, you grow your intercessory prayer. And the more you do it, the more you're able to do it. Prayer, every kind of prayer is addictive. The more you do it, the more you'll want to do it. The less you do it, the less you'll want to do it. So you've just got to go make yourself pray, go into intercession to people you love, and it'll grow into other areas. And the more you do it, the more you'll be able to do it, the deeper you'll be able to go until sometimes you won't even have words. You get to interceding for your city, interceding for situations. You won't be able to express it, and you go into moaning and groaning. Now, I would like to balance all that out with the fact that if you are a person who does very much interceding at all, especially if you get into the heavy intercession where it gets into tongues and deep grief of the spirit, uh, you need to balance that out by being a worshiper. When you get to the house of God or sometime that day, you need to get some happy music going. You need to let some hallelujahs roll because the joy of the Lord is your strength and intercessory prayer. Uh, actually, you're, you're just literally almost dying. You're certainly weakening. The apostle said, death worketh in us that life may work in you. Intercessory prayer is a deep work of the cross. It's a dying out on behalf of someone else. So you got to watch these intercessors. They'll become very heavy, very moody, very difficult people. All right. Well, like I said, I'm sure we could go for a long, long time. Uh, but Brother Kleindance, again, thank you so much. You have shared so many rich things uh, with us tonight. And uh, again, you can go to his website and get those resources. Um, just a reminder, next month, we're going to be glad to have Brother Daryl Johns with us. Speaking on the minister and family life, it's going to be a great session, and uh, we look forward to that. But uh, just uh, know, Brother Kleinitz, we're so thankful for your ministry, so thankful for the instruction, and may God help all of us to be used in greater ways through the knowledge that we've gained tonight. Could I pray over everybody before we? Oh, decide? that would be that would be an awesome way to end. Lord Jesus, as we have studied your word and we have opened our spirits up to these various flows, these ways for the spirit to manifest through us and to reveal your power through us and your glory through us. I pray that there would be an impartation through this teaching, an impartation through the years of experience, Lord, that have brought us to some understandings, that it has gone forth as seed into the heart, that it be seed that would fall on the good soil of the heart and of the mind and the intellect. And I pray now 
with apostolic authority and apostolic power through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will stir up the gifts that are in these men and women of God. Stir it up, O Lord, I pray. Activate it in their lives. Stir them up to it. Let it bleed out in preaching. Let it bleed out in their prayer. Let it bleed out in counseling. Let it bleed through, Lord, as they're in the just around people doing the work of ministry, teaching Bible studies. I ask you, Lord, that the gifts of the Spirit would be so strongly activated and stirred up in all of us in the days and the weeks to come. Lead us, God, into hungering and thirsting after you deeper than we ever have in the history of our lives, oh God, I pray. And we'll give you the glory and everybody say in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless all of you. And uh, we look forward to wonderful times together next month again. And again, Brother Finance, God bless you, my friend. I put my phone number on the screen. Thank you, Brother Watts. Okay, we'll leave it there again for just a minute then. Uh, so if you need that phone number, it's there on the screen. God bless y'all.